A very good evening to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Victoria Memorial Hall, uh, to the third in the series of uh, three events of conversations that we have held here during the course of this month, together with the Siegel Foundation for the Arts. Today's conversation is going to be between Paul Holden Graeber and Sandeep Roy. Paul Holden Graeber is a founding executive director of NASA's Foundation LA, a center for dialogue. As former director of Life from New York Public Library, an interview series he presided over with impish erudition from 2004 to 2018, Holden Graeber is widely regarded as a master conversationalist. His programs have become known worldwide for providing a forum in which audiences can engage with some of the most influential public figures in every discipline. He has spoken with everyone from Patti Smith to Zadie Smith, Ricky Jay to Jay-Z, Errol Morris to Jan Morris, and so on and so forth, and the list can go on and on and on. Yeah. Today, he's going to be in conversation with Sandeep Rai. Sandeep Rai is known to most of you through many of the literary events that take place in this city. Uh, he has been an expert conversationalist also at the Calcutta level and at the Indian national and the international level. His first novel is Don't Let Him Know. He hosted a radio show in San Francisco for a decade and currently helms the Sandeep Roy show on Express Audio. So I'm sure we are going to be in for a very, very exciting and exhilarating session of conversation between these two gentlemen this evening. So without any further ado, may I request both of you to kindly take your seats on the stage Please, Paul Holden Graeber and Sandeep Roy. And before I hand over proceedings to Sandeep for the rest of the evening, may I request uh, the Secretary and Curator of Victoria Memorial Hall, Jayanta Sengupta, to kindly hand over mementos on behalf of Victoria Memorial Hall to our important duo on the stage today. And of course, the customary reminder, which you don't need to be reminded about anymore, about your mobile phones, to put them on silent mode or switch them off, please. With that, I hand over proceeding to Sandeep. And Sandeep will take you through the evening and follow up the conversation with a Q&A session with the audience, I'm sure, right? OK, over to you, Sandeep. Thank you, Raju. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. and. Um, Thanks to both Seagull and Victoria Memorial for doing this. And uh, welcome to Kolkata and India, Paul. Thank you so much. It's been absolutely wonderful to be here. I've, I've enjoyed every moment of it, including um, you know, all the honking. It felt to me after a while that it became like a symphony. Um, I, I, I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it. It's become a melodious cacophony in my mind. And uh, you guys should note this uh, outfit that Paul is wearing. You know, some people go to some place and they say, all I got was a T-shirt. But you, no, in no, no. two days, uh, no, yes, no, you, no, no, you no. I, I, I want to show you. I mean, my mother used to always say that I was fine and dandy. So I, I stress the dandy. I mean, look at this. I'm, I'm making a, a, a promo. No, I mean, really. OK, we can go, in, we can go now. No. <laughs> Made in Calcutta in what, two days? In two days. In two days. Bengal means business, right? <laughs> very much. This is, um, you know, this is very impressive. But uh, <laughs> are you done arranging your jacket? <laughs> Good. All right. You know, um, when I do these events, Paul, often um, I fret and worry about the perfect first question, you know, like what do you, how do you start the conversation? And uh, then, but, so I was fretting and worrying about our conversation today and, 
And then I thought, oh no, I can actually cheat. I mean, you are usually on this side of the microphone asking people questions. So my first question to you is quite an easy one for me to ask, which is basically, do you have first question anxiety? I have anxiety. <laughs> um, I have anxiety and I have first question anxiety and I have last question anxiety. I do, in my mind, begin a conversation with what I call an arc of a conversation, mm -hmm. which is the beginning, I usually know the, what I might start out with and where I might end. Irrespective but, uh, of what happens. Well, and then of course it doesn't happen like that at all, but I do have first question anxiety because I think the first question, and I think in a way we set the tone beautifully with my suit. I, I feel that that was the first <laughs> entrance. You, 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 you got an introduction to what I'm wearing before hearing what's in my mind. Uh, but I do have an anxiety about the first question, and I think about it and fret about it enormously. I often say, you know, because people say it looks so easy, but I always say that improvisation is something you prepare, right? And you prepare it for a time. And you, you don't over-prepare it, but you, you have in your mind what you might want to ask. So yes, I do have anxiety. Good, now I feel much yeah, better yeah. about it. You know, since um, you said um, that we got to see Paul in sort of action before hearing him in a, in a way, but uh, for those of you who haven't heard Paul do interview, I wanted to play just a little game. I'll play you a little clip of a couple of interviews that Paul has done. And I'm not going to tell you who he's talking to, but I will ask you at the end if you can guess who the person being talked to. Maybe there'll be a prize, I don't know. Um, but, uh, but listen carefully because there are clues in the little clips that you will hear. So let's now hope that technology cooperates, okay? Would you like to relax to blow off? It's okay, it's okay. It, it's audio. So here's the first clip. I was strangely jealous of my mother's nostalgia, though as I watched her being consumed by it, I just, I just hoped somehow I could do something about it. I mean, I remember once I gave her a little, I gave her a wallet as a gift and I went to Calcutta and I took a photograph of the building where she was raised, you know, her, her Ithaca, her everything, you know, her frame of reference the place where she was happy, right? And I took a little picture of it and I put it in the little transparent window and I gave this to her as her gift and I thought, well, maybe every time she opens up the wallet, it's the fact that a specific place, one place in the world, one building in one city, you know, in the world is, is the center of, you know, what I perceive to be the center of my mother's happiness and well-being. You know, and I, and I felt like, I feel like all of the books I've written until this, they're all about that, it's all in a sense trying to put into books the picture in that wallet. Do you see? That, that's the comma, my parents. Yes, that's it. It's like, how can I render present? How can I bring to them what is missing? All right. Who do you think that was? Any guesses? Yeah? Jumpalairi, very much so. Full price, <laughs> full marks to you, Iti. <laughs> Paul, when you would, you know, you've said that you're somebody who grew up all over the place. Your parents. I'm not sure I grew up yet. It's, you don't, it's, okay. It's, it's you're work, growing it's, up all over the place. It's a work in progress. It's still. a work in progress, okay. good. Your parents fled Vienna right. during the war, and they moved to Haiti. So, so they had to move around, you know, the circumstances of their moving are very different from Chupalahiri's parents moving, who chose to move for economic reasons, perhaps. But uh, when you heard Jumpa talking about that, do you think that would resonate with your parents? It would resonate with my parents, and I think that Jumpa had, I mean, one of the most important things you can do in a conversation is try to, as best as you can, put yourself in somebody else's shoes, however uncomfortable they are. So it's, it's a work of empathy mm. of a certain kind. And um, I, I think she had a sense um, that my own story 
um, was in some way echoing hers and vice versa. My parents briefly, let, let me just indulge you for a moment and, and speak about them because they would be incredibly, I think, amazed and, and proud and, and, um, and um, so happy to see me here today. Uh, my, my father and mother left Vienna just in time. My father left on the 15th of uh, June 1938 uh, from Vienna, the very last day you could leave before the borders were closed, and ended up spending the war years in Haiti. There were 107 Jewish families in Haiti. And my father was 21 years old. He had been a medical student in, in Vienna in the best medical school in the world, he said, but Montpellier, I, n I never knew why Montpellier, but he always said, but Montpellier, and ended up becoming a farmer in Haiti. He ended up, he, um, the, the Minister of Agriculture there said, you can't grow anything here but these vegetables. And my father said, no, 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 let me go to the university library and research whatever it is I can find. And he went to the library and discovered that the land of Haiti was similar to the land of Senegal. So he sent a letter to Burpees. Burpees is a company seeds. in Chicago that sells seeds. And he said, dear Burpee, I am Kurt Holdengraber, and I am a friendly enemy alien. So that, that, this was the terms of, of his identity. I'm a friendly enemy alien. And I have discovered that the soil here is, will be able to, we will be able to grow vegetables, carrots, and various lettuce. Am I right? And about three months later, he got a huge box from Burpees with thousands of seeds. And when we went to Haiti, 40 years later, he took my sister, my mother, and me to Haiti. My parents got married in Haiti and were then subsequently married for 71 years. When we went to, to Haiti, my father, we were at the market, and my father showed me certain vegetables and said, you see, you see, Paulie, this is my legacy. And I said to him, but we have to write, we have to write this story. He said, no, 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 no. I sent you to very fine schools. You write it, I live it which, if ever I write a book, might be the first line. And so then, to, since, digress, since I always digress, coming back to Jumpa, Jumpa's story um, resonated deeply with me, and differently put, I elicit, Jumpa is very recalcitrant, which literally means she, she kicks back. She doesn't want to expose herself too much. I think she actually, uh, Sandeep and I were talking about this earlier, she actually doesn't like uh, being on stage um, and being interviewed, which I can understand now being in this <laughs> position rather than in that one. It's not that easy. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm containing myself. I'm containing whatever it is I need to contain. But I will say, um, speaking about her mother was one way of opening that Pandora's box. It was one way of getting her to talk. It was one way of eliciting from her a story which matters greatly. And I thought that it was very beautiful the way she spoke about nostalgia sure. and the way she spoke about trying in some way to because, connect with her mother. Yeah, because nostalgia is something we're often taught as something that you must eschew, that it is a weakness, that it is a failing, that you know, this is a city, Calcutta, which is often accused of being living in nostalgia. How, how you see, this is going to happen. I'm going to ask a question. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, to... it's unavoidable, but how so? Because it's a city that is supposed to remember a certain past, a cosmo, cosmopolitan past, and that it lives in the glory. You went to the Tagore house today, so it remembers it was, Tagore yeah. and Satyajit Ray, and it seems to, people say, it has never shaken off that aura and prefers to look in the rear view mirror. That's what people often say, that a friend of mine would say, if nostalgia were a state, Calcutta would be its capital. Well, you know, I, I, I must be very weak. I'm, I'm filled with it myself. I, I've tried at moments uh, to shake it because I think 
nostalgia when it becomes a, a mode of life and particularly when it takes forms in politics can be very dangerous. Mm -hmm. But on an emotional level, sorry, on an emotional level, I, I feel it very, very strongly. And I, I think, um, I always think of the extraordinary uh, origin of the word nostalgia, which was coined by a, a doctor in, in Switzerland in 1643, I believe, Adalbert Hoffer, who discovered that the mercenary soldiers of Switzerland suffered from a disease which he called nostos algos, a pain for the return, a pain for the homeland. And these were mercenary soldiers who, when they went away from beautiful Switzerland to fight battles in foreign countries, felt a longing for the Alps. So he called it nostalgia. And one can often be nostalgic for things one, at the time when one lived it, one didn't love. I'm, I'm always reminded of that extraordinary line of Susan Sontag, who says about traveling, she says, just wait until now becomes then. Mm -hmm. You'll see how happy we were. You just mentioned, uh, speaking of digressions, I'm digressing now. You mentioned your parents were married for 71 years. Yeah. As somebody, as someone who is a conversationalist, as someone who does conversation, you know, for three decades you've been leading conversations, I wonder after 71 years together, what happens to conversation? Do you run, do, did they run out of things to say? You know, I, I think they really didn't. I, I will say a few things about um, what, what kept the marriage going. I mean, I think later in life one looks at one's parents and what seemed a certain way, and especially if one is prone to analysis, whether formal or informal, mm. one begins to wonder, you know, 71 years, really? I mean, that's quite a feat. They probably could fit into the Guinness Book nearly. Um, but 71 years is quite something. My father had an advantage over many people, which is he was very, very hard of hearing. <laughs> and he used to say that that helped greatly. I mean, you know, it, he didn't have to hear what I had to say, for instance, which means that now I think I enunciate, even though I have a lisp, I enunciate clearly. Um, because I wanted to be heard. But he said, it's so great, you know, comes here, goes out there, I don't know. So he didn't have to hear everything that was said. But I think, you know, um, to answer that question uh, in terms of, of also, in terms of conversation, it was so important in the family to, uh, to argue hmm. and to tell stories. To, um, yesterday I was telling the students that my, my father was a very judgmental man. He never, he never would say, in my view, it was always his view was the right view. But when I was, before I turned 21, he believed that it was immoral, was his word, for me to travel any other way than hitchhiking. And so I hitchhiked around, around the United States, I hitchhiked around Europe, and it was very important in terms of getting to know countries, and certainly in, in terms of contributing to my confusion of where I belong, but it also uh, made it clear to me that I had to say something that was interesting mm. to pay for my ride. Would you recommend the same to your sons? Well, I, I would, but my wife, I think, um, is so terrified <laughs> by that notion, and I think Sadly, um, I think we've become a, a, a culture now that is coddling our children all too much. I, I worry greatly about what the generation that is now in their teens mm. will be in 25 years from now. Um, will they be strong enough? I think there's so much, there's so much, that I don't remember my parents talking as much as my friends in New York and now in Los Angeles do about what school, we, we, we went to school. Uh, okay, you learn something. My father was skeptical that you would learn a lot. My mother thought it really didn't matter that much because in the end what mattered was the experiences you had on the road. Um, but I would recommend it, but uh, I, I suspect I've, I've, I've sort of failed. I haven't transmitted that quite. Well, I, I'm sure people here understand fully well about 
the conversation around schools. It's a favorite topic of conversation. Really? Yeah. Which school do you go to? How do you get your children into school? There's a whole cottage industry aimed at just getting children into school. And is the result better? No, of course not. No, no. But that, that's what, and are, are, you know, in the end, are the, 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 the pupils more curious? I mean, the really. No, 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 the, school is not meant about you, for you to be, no, the last thing you want your child to, in school to be is to be curious. That is an absolute no-no. Uh, you see, I mean, for me, uh, the, the problem I have is that my older son knows this about me and knows that well, all I care is that he learns things that interest him. That, you know, that, that and, and he also knows that his father was terrible at taking certain tests. In 1973, in Belgium, they brought in a, a direct import from America, which they called le test américain, the American test. What was it? A multiple choice test. And they had never had that before. And I was awful at it. Why? Not because I couldn't figure it out. I don't think so. But I always felt rather ambivalent. It could be this. It could be that. It depends what point of view you have. I mean, if you look at it from this point of view, maybe this is the right answer. If you look at it from this point of view, maybe it's that, that, that is the right answer. And my, my older son knows this about me. And I think that it, it, this, in, you know, what was, what was a real problem in school has served me professionally rather well, which is that I think in a conversation such as the one we're having, um, it is important to see many, many, mm. many different sides. I often remember that wonderful line of, of Robert Frost who said that a liberal is someone who can never take his own side in an argument. And I've always loved that, that way of thinking. You, you, you see it from many, many different points of view. Well, you've been described, I mean, speaking of curiosity, you've been described as a curator of public curiosity. I was curious what you thought about the word, I was curious. I was curious what you thought about the word curator because um, a friend of mine forwarded me this clipping where Benjamin Dreyer, uh, the writer says, don't use curate for what you're doing when, you are, when all you're doing is organizing a playlist of motivating songs for gym use. Right. So is, is this word curator, has it become way too overused? Way too overused. But here, here was my problem, is that people asked me to define what I did. And I'm still wondering, I mean, what do I do? I, one of the ways I can express it is I say I chat for a living. Um, another way I can say is that I try to make other people, I try to, I'm, I'm like, um, uh, excuse me this gender confusion, but I'm, I'm like a midwife. Uh, for people's conversation. I'm trying to, to give birth, as it were, to, to something that, that, that needs a push, as it were. Um, so, and then I, I came up with this term uh, of curator of public curiosity. I think it's pretty good. I, I, I can stroke, I like it. I like it because I'm using the word curator not in terms of curating a restaurant, not in terms of, you know, something that is, one might say, instrumental. Curiosity, you know, is something very, you know, I, I, I think Dorothy Parker said, you know, the, the cure for boredom is curiosity. What the cure for curiosity is, nobody has found out. So I, the cat I, did, yeah, but it killed uh, it. Yeah, the, 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 so the cat was killed, but Holden Grabe is still alive. And, you know, I, I, I actually think, because some journalist at some point asked me, what do you do? And I came up with that term. And then another journalist said, if you had to define what you do in two words, could you do it? I said, two? Can, can, can you give me three, please? And, um, and I came up with two words, which were cogn that what I do is a form of cognitive theater. And I, I, I like those two words mm. together as well. But the word curator is way too overused, but, and it means, but you know, in, in essence, what it means is to take care of, hmm. um, to, to be responsible for something. Which uh, curare. We've, for, we've forgotten. Yeah, that we've movie. forgotten. But speaking of like, you know, when you say to describe what you do, more importantly, when you were starting out, how did your 
mother describe what you did to her friends? Um, My son it, talks to no, people. It, it, uh, <laughs> um, it's interesting, you know, a, a lot of things are going through my mind now. And what's going through my mind, first of all, is the fact that you're trying to open me up by talking about my mother the way I try to do with Jhumpa Lahiri, right? So, so well done, well done, well done, my dear mother. Um, um, I, I think, um, you know, they, they, both my parents had the wish at, at some point in their lives that I might be a little more practical. And my father, you know, tried in one way or another, and my mother tried in one way or another, but then they knew it was futile. I got interested in, in law at first, and then philosophy, and I got very serious, tremendously serious. When I was 18, I, I had friends who wore black and dark black, and my mother was really wondering, you know, don't you have any friends who play tennis? I mean, she was quite, quite, quite concerned by kind of the gloom and doom. Life was either catastrophic or tragic. Those were the kinds of two possibilities. And then when I started to, I, you know, before doing this public conversation, I was a professor at university. Mm -hmm. I taught literature, I taught comparative literature at Princeton and then at Williams College and then at, at other, other fancy schools in the, in the US. And then I sort of stopped doing that because the whole business of publish or perish really made me feel that I would perish. And it also made me know that I needed a public. Mm. I relish a public. I relish, um, I relish that. So I think my, my mother probably tried to, um, to say, Paul talks to people about interesting things. Maybe she would have said something like that. And maybe she would have said, you know, he's in charge of the New York Public Library, Library. which is absolutely not true. <laughs> and, you know, people used to repeat that, but I'm really not. If you're the president of the New York Public Library, one of the main goals in your life is to raise money. And uh, that was never something I had to do. Um, so she, I, think she was, I think she was proud of the literary bent. My mother, what, during all the years I mm -hmm. taught, um, she would read the books that I would assign to my students. And we would talk on the phone from uh, Princeton or Williams to Brussels, and she would say, I just read The Nose by Gogol. What a great book. Um, what do you think? And then we would have a 10-minute chat on the phone. They came from a world, the world of yesterday that Stefan Zweig describes, a world of Mitteleuropa where culture mattered. Mm. So they, 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 um, they decided to be reconciled with the fact that I was a bit of a Luftmensch, uh, which is a Yiddish term, which means uh, someone who has his feet firmly planted in midair. Which is probably what keeps you curious. It, it does keep me curious. It co also keeps me off balance. <laughs> Which is the best thing to yeah. be. But speaking of the people that you have conversation, I wanted to play another clip. Same rules as before. I'm not going to say who it is. You get to guess. Just before coming down here today, I took you to the rare book room to see a first edition of Machiavelli. You said to me when we left the... The, the special collections, you, you said, you know, the most stolen items in the world are books. They are most um, priceless possessions. Because if you think about it, you know, a room without a book is like a body without a soul. You know, we have to, um, it's the only way that we can connect the future with the past. The value of history is not necessarily scientific, but moral by liberating our minds and, you know, deepening our sympathies and fortifying our will. We, um, we, we can control um, pretty much, history allows us to control not society but ourselves, which is a much more important thing to do, you know what I mean? And it, and it would allow us to pretty much um, meet the future more so than foretell it. In my deep heart, I never think that I, I was a great fighter. I don't think I was a great fighter. You didn't? No. Really? No, no. But I'm an incredible student. I'm a great, great, I'm an astronomical student. 
that I could project greatness without being great. And that's what... Well, who do you think that was? Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson. So when you interview somebody like Mike Tyson, did he surprise you? Um, probably my single favorite interview, probably one of the most articulate, um, one of, probably one of the most articulate, deep people I've, I've ever spoken to. Vulnerable, vicious, violent, but also, as you could hear, hear, can you hear me? It's going in and out a little bit. Um, as you can hear here, he really was very, very able to, to construct the thought. And I, when I arrived here at the Victoria tonight, I was thinking, wow, and, and you were playing the clips just to see that they would work well, thinking, wow, would Mike love, Iron Mike, Mike as he's known, would he love to be next to this figure that nearly looks like a gla gladiator? He would so adore being here. Um, he um, had, you know, he was educated by Cus D'Amato, who was this great teacher of his, and who told him, both when he got into trouble and during the time that he was his student, read, 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 read. And Mike read, 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 read. What surprised me is something that uh, in, in a sense is so important to think about, which is that people are not who you think they are. They are really not. And when I tell people a little bit out of provocation, and I'm wondering if I'm provoking you by saying that Mike Tyson was one of the most interesting people I've ever spoken to. You know, you can think of, uh, you know, I spoke with uh, David Lynch and uh, Werner Herzog and Pico Aya and President Clinton and Keith Richards and Pete Townsend and Brian Eno, and Anish Kapoor, and Peter Sellers, and et cetera, et cetera. I could, I could stun you by name dropping it for a very long time, 700 interviews. Mike Tyson stands out um, so much because there is a man who left school when he was seven and a half years old. His parents, both his mother in particular, was in the sex uh, business, and so she would have her clients over and during that time, the little Mike, seven years old, would steal from, from her clients and take the money and then discovered actually, not only should I steal from the pants, but I should go to their house and take everything that they own. So he led, led a life of, you know, of, of real um, delinquency and then, of course, was uh, accused of rape and spent three and a half years in, in prison. I remember how complicated it was from the point of view of the library when I said I was inviting Mike Tyson. I thankfully didn't have to work with a committee. I actually, when I took the job at the library, I put two conditions on my job. I forgot the third, which would have been compensation. But the two that I remembered was I said, no committees, no meetings. You know, it's an informed subjectivity that will make the choices but not committees, please, please, let's have no committees. So I never, I never asked for permission, only forgiveness. But when people found out that Mike Tyson was coming, people were up in arms. You know, how can I invite a, a, a predator? And I said, I'm not inviting him for that reason. I'm inviting him be because he's so interesting. But that leads us to a problem, like right. in this day and age, like, for example, with all the Me Too stuff that's happening. Right. Now, if you were to, say, invite somebody like a Harvey Weinstein right. on stage, would you have qualms about that? I would. You would? I would. I would. I would have qualms inviting a, a, a revisionist historian. I would have, I mean, I, but I think that there's a, am I right, am I wrong? I don't know, but I'll try. Um, I somehow feel there's a very big difference between a Mike Tyson who was indicted uh, for crimes he may or may not have committed, but served. Hmm. He served his time, and then, you know, I was asked by the students yesterday if the main, the main reason I invited people were because they had written books. It's true that many, many times the book was a hook, right? The book was a hook, but then one tried I mean, one of the most important things in a conversation is to go beyond the book, and maybe not even to go 
if a conversation is interesting, the people will buy the book, which publishers are particularly interested in. But um, I think I wouldn't, I don't think that I, I would be um, interested in Harvey Weinstein's story. I know that I was incredibly hmm. intrigued by Mike Tyson's story. And he said all, I mean, that line, that, do you remember that line at the very beginning? I've the taken room. him to see Machiavelli's The Prince because I, I, I know from informed sources that he's a lover of Machiavelli. So we show him a first edition of Machiavelli. He tells the chief curator of the library, no, there's an earlier edition of the, of the prince in the Vatican. He's absolutely right. The curator is completely stunned. Why? Because the curator can't imagine that a man who doesn't have a formal education would know that. It's on us to, to think how poorly educated we are as to think that only people who have formal education have curiosity, right? I mean, it's, it's wrong. It's, it's wrong in so many ways. So many people who have gone to school are, are, are I mean, are terribly boring, right? So, he, he, I mean, there, there is Mike Tyson saying that. And then he says to me, without, without pause, a, a, a room without a book, is a room without books is like a body without a soul. Does anybody recognize that quotation? Because it is a quotation. Well, it's actually Cicero. So Mike Tyson is quoting Cicero and in context. It's amazing. And, think, and, and that surprised me, and, it's, it's, and I didn't recognize it. Has an interview ever changed the way you think? The way I think. Um, Yes, I think it, it changes, it goes into my bloodstream and mm. changes me all the time. I mean, that's such an interesting question. Yes, I think I'm, I'm inhabited by all these voices. I mean, this is very strange for me, uh, but very interesting because, um, and very uncomfortable and very wonderful, um, and all of the above. Um, but yes, I think it, it changes you without maybe changing you at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think that whole notion, uh, Sandeep, of, of what, what changes us, you know, how do we change our minds? And I think one of the ways we change our minds is by talking to each other. I think that one of the worst problems of our day and age now is that people don't talk to each other. Um, you know, it always, forgive me, I'm, I always say that I'm a quotomaniac by profession, but there's this wonderful line in Pascal about war. And it's a very simple pensée where he says, but why do you kill me? And the answer is, but don't you live on the other side of the river? And, you know, if you think of conversation as a way of bridging the river, of pontificating in the true Latin sense of the word pontifex, of building a bridge between two worlds, conversation, I think, when we talk to each other, mm -hmm. we are, if we really talk to each other, I think we do change we can change. There is at least the possibility, possibility. the illusion, perhaps. And I'm, you know, I'm always hopeful. Uh, I'm hopeful that what we do when we do this is something that has some value, that is more than just an entertainment for you for an hour. So conversation, in that sense, how do you look at the enormous success of something like the TEDx talks, where people are more sort of more passively receiving a lecture, and these talks have, you know, some people say it's become the TEDx carnival, the TEDx circus that goes around the world. So, as someone who believes so much in conversation and that back and right. forth, what do you do? Do you see a tension between the lecture and the conversation? I must say. Um Lectures never appeal to me at all, and I've, I've had nearly none of them at the library and elsewhere. Um, I, I think that um, I, if it's a lecture, I just would prefer to have a single malt by my side and read it in a comfortable chair away from being in a, I think that the, the, the greatness of conversation is that you really don't know where, where things will go. Um, as for TED, I should be careful, but who cares? I won't be careful. I, I don't take to it. It, it. it feels to me terribly canned. Um, it, you know, the PowerPoint view of life 
seems to me um, so, I feel rather despondent about it. It feels like people know what they're going to say. It's, mm. it's, it's, it's like prepackaged. It's like prepackaged culture. It's not what, you know, Werner Herzog has this wonderful line when he talks about culture. He says, culture is a collective agitation of the mind. And that's what I think this should be about. And I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm not in favor of it at all. I much prefer the notion of failing uh, at a conversation than being successful at a TED talk. And in my mind, what I'm aspiring all the time is nearly in a platonic idea, the idea of the perfect conversation, which eludes me as much as... Well, your career would be over if you found it. It would be like a collector who gets the last piece in his collection, and right? And dies. And then dies. dies. I mean, the whole point is a search. The whole point is that you can't. The whole point is that after we leave this stage now, I will, and maybe you will, say, God <laughs> damn it, why didn't I ask this? But forget the perfect conversation. What struck me when I was thinking about what we actually, we can't hope to reach the perfect conversation. Well, we may hope to reach the perfect conversation, but it's very difficult. But uh, what makes for a successful conversation, which may not be perfect, and you had a quote from Simon Weil, Weil, Weil uh, the French philosopher, and the quote goes, attention is a form of prayer. And I thought, when I read that, I was like, that's what actually conversation is about, attention. Wow, wow. Um, so yes, Simon Weil said that attention is a form of prayer. And I think if you, if you think of it today, um, to quote somebody else, T.S. Eliot said that we are distracted from distraction by distraction. Um, and so a conversation... And he said that before social media. And before, yes. And before Facebook. A, yeah, and you know, and, and before all of that, and which I espouse in, in part, but getting back to, to conversation as a form of prayer, or attention is, you know, sustained attention is a form of prayer. Um, attention, it is so tremendously important and such a rare commodity that we pay attention for a sustained period of time. When was the last time um, we read a long Russian novel? Uh, you know, when was the last time when we just isolated ourselves and turned our, off our our machines and left them behind and didn't think that we had to respond immediately to every supposedly urgent message, but actually stayed in the moment. Actually, so, let me ask people yeah. here. In the last month, how many of you did that? Turned it off and just... For four hours. One person, two people, three people. Okay, no, no. See, this is why people. we said yeah. this is a very cultured city. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 and I, no, and I think, I, and I think, you know, I don't mean to. I mean, it, it can sound terribly presumptuous and pompous to say that, but I think, you know, we're we're, we're tools of our tools. We're we're so driven by them uh, in such a powerful way, and and certainly the people in Silicon Valley and elsewhere know that you know we may have gotten rid of tobacco, but there's now another form of addiction. I mean, it's just very clear and simple that it, you know, it, it, it gets us very, gets our adrenaline very, very it's, hyped it's up. It's our dopamine yeah. fix. I yeah. mean, it is our dopamine fix. It is. It is very much so. But to come back, I want to somehow focus my attention, as it were, on the notion of attention and on the f notion of a conversation as a form of prayer. I, I think that what makes for a conversation to be successful, at least in part, is... Um, when something happens, all of a sudden, um, you've said something and it resonates. Um, something new is said. I, I think I told the students yesterday that I'm always so amazed when people come up and say, this was the best conversation I've ever heard. And I think to myself, oh my god, it was so bad. But the life. But if you like this conversation, good. But the great compliments are when a parent, a father, a mother, a sister, a brother, somebody says, 
I heard my father, sister, brother, lover, mother say something that they haven't mm. said before. That is really when it becomes really, really exciting. But also, in the space of, of, of the conversation, what, what, what is special is when you forget the audience in some way. And it's really a conversation between us and people, and we're eavesdropping on each other. And we're trying to figure out, you know, what is in your mind? Why are you asking me this question? Why are you, Sandeep, quoting back to me, <laughs> Simone Weil? Why are you doing this to me? Um, what are you trying to get at? And that is another really interesting question. Uh, you know, are you, you, you've obviously done what I often do, which is you've researched, I've become your subject for yeah. a while, right? You've, but that's, you've lived with me for a while. I've lived with you and then I have to somehow figure out you know, I know all this stuff about you, but then I have to think like, so what do I want to find out what do about you, you? So what do you <laughs> want to find out? Come on, tell me, what I, do you want to find out? I might, I might be able to tell you, but... I, I want to find out, when you, when you yeah. interview a Patti Smith, yeah. when you interview a Mike Tyson, when you right. interview people you admire, do you want to be liked by them? Well, what's the alternative? You could have a tremendously uncomfortable conversation. They may not like you. It might be riveting for the audience. Um, I, but I, um, so, the answer is yes. I must admit, my ego, maybe more trips to India and the sense of emptying myself of this desire. No, no, this hasn't happened in India anymore. No? We've become American. It's oh. <laughs> We've become California. <laughs> maybe in California now. You maybe, go to maybe, Berkeley, maybe you might now be able to empty yourself. But I, I would like to free myself of the desire of being loved. So if people here are loving me, all the better. But, um, and, and I, I, do, I, do, I do want to ingratiate myself. And it's a very strange thing because I create in an hour a feeling of intimacy. And I say it's a feeling because very often it's just a moment. It's just one hour of something that happened and very often I don't see these people again. And they don't see me. Some of them have become friends, but most of them have not. They're fleeting moments in one's life story. What is interesting about someone like Patti Smith, which is one of my favorite moments ever, um, is I didn't grow up listening to Patti Smith at all. Actually, you know, at that point in life, I was listening to um, classical music and jazz. When I was 15 years old and everybody was probably listening to Patti Smith, I was listening to completely different things and there was a kind of a chiasmatic moment. When I turned 51 instead of 15, I discovered Patti Smith, Smith, but not through her music, through but through her books, through... Um, through Just Kids, her, her love story with Maplethorpe and with New York. And I wrote her a fan letter, and I said, Dear Patti Smith, I don't know you at all, and your book came out four years ago, and I just fell in love with you. And, um, you know, I, I just want to talk to you. And she responded and said, Yes, I, I would like that very much. Shall I bring my guitar? And I thought to myself, well, you know, yeah. <laughs> and she brought it, and she played, and it was miraculous. And I discovered all kinds of things, but I did. I, you know, one of the most wonderful things about her is when she arrived, she arrived bearing gifts. She gave me books. She gave me all, all kinds of things before. So there was this feeling that she was already showering mm. with me with, with affection before we even spoke. But yes, but there are plenty of people that have been, re that I absolutely haven't been able to touch. Um, failed interviews, moment, I've spoken to, to artists in particular, but not only, where nothing happens. Nothing happens. So one of the things, so the inverse of it is, a good conversation is when there is generosity of spirit mm. um, and when there is um, 
when there is something that um, that happens that hasn't happened before. Well, one of the persons with whom you haven't had a, you want ships that passed by at night at the New York Public Library, is Werner Herzog. You right. say you talk to Werner Herzog about every year or so. Let's yeah. play a little clip yeah. so that people hear a bit and. Uh, This one I've just given away who it is, so no I always loved also in the beginning of Lessons of Darkness where you have that famous line by Pascal um, that you also uh, yeah, it's, invent. It's, it's, and, and it's you, beautiful because it says a written caption and it says, and it really sounds like Blaise Pascal, and it says, um, <laughs> um, what is the right quote? Um, I don't remember, but it really does sound like Pascal. Yeah. I, 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 trust yeah. me. The cataclysm, of the, the cataclysm of the stellar universe will occur like creation in grandiose splendor and under it blares Pascal. Of course, I made it up and plus Pascal couldn't have said it better. So, uh, and, but what I'm doing with that is I lift, I elevate the audience to a very, very high level and from there on they step into the film and they never let them go down from, from there. So, yes, I, I do things that are against the textbook, against what you learn in film school, what you learn in, when, when you look at the films that are playing in, on television, uh, HBO, PBS, they would never allow something like this. They would fact check it and, and dismiss the film. Let, let them fact check to their death. <laughs> Let them fact check to their death. What brings you back to Herzog every year? Well, you know, there are a few people. Um, Werner Herzog is one of them. Werner Herzog is one of the, I, I think, in, uh, at least in my estimation, one of the greatest filmmakers alive today. Did Aguirre and uh, um, Wojciech and Grizzly Man and Fitzcarraldo. I mean, I'm. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with his films. He's done 75 of them. And we often joke with each other that we, we need to speak to each other once a year. And I say I need to speak to Werner Herzog once a year to remain sane. Um, a lot of people think that uh, Herzog is rather insane, and I don't think so at all. I think he's been close to people who are rather insane, like Klaus Kinski, actually. Werner says that every gray hair that he has on his forehead is, um, he calls it a Klaus Kinski. And in fact, Werner is really, you know, I'll give you a little tiny story and then I'll, I'll come back to that question. Werner and Lena were on a plane together once and the plane, was, there was a lot of turbulence on the plane. And Lena, his wife, turned to Werner and said, Werner, you know, I'm worried. And he, said, and he said, by what? And he said, well, there's so much turbulence. And, he, and Werner said, don't worry. One way or another, the plane will come down. <laughs> and I mean, that is, a, that, that is not the, 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 the ramblings of a madman. That's actually reality in its purest form. So Werner keeps me honest. There are always, always more things to talk to him about. He's one of the most productive people I know, so he's now finishing four movies. One of them was finished on Gorbachev. Another one is coming out on Bruce Chatwin in a, in a little while. We'll be speaking about it in Athens in, a month, in two months' time. So we, we, we speak together, and then supposedly we sound a bit alike. Um, so it's kind of comical. There's an aspect of it. You know, some people have... I, I've, I've gotten this remark from a lot of people. Uh, I haven't made a single movie in my lifetime that I know of, uh, but people say, you know, you, you sound a lot like Werner Herzog, so maybe by osmosis this has happened. But it's interesting to talk to people over time. Hmm. It's interesting to talk, it's, it's like reading and rereading books and seeing what do we remain faithful to? What has changed? Do we, you know, one of the most important things is can we manage not to repeat ourselves? Even here, I, 
I, I, I know that I'm saying things that I've said before and I can hear myself saying that and I'm trying to get out of them. But as I'm trying to get out of them, I can't resist telling you this story of Miles Davis. Miles Davis was once um, in, in uh, New York and a friend of mine was writing a book about him. And he uh, ca called up Miles Davis because a concert at Carnegie Hall was sold out and he said, Miles, can you get me two tickets? And Miles said, absolutely. Anything else I can do for you, Michael? And he said, yes. The friend I'm bringing along with me loves my funny, funny Valentine. And Miles Davis said to him, tell your friend to buy the record. <laughs> and I mean, that is, you know, the problem. And I've had this, you know, uh, I mean, this, this is, of course, when you're, you're so filled with everybody else's voice, things come back to you all the time. And because I mentioned to you the disease from which I wish no cure, namely quotomania, I keep quoting things and I quote them to different people to gauge the different reaction the same quotation might have in someone else. Somebody else I, I speak to over a long period of time is an uh, English psychoanalyst, Adam Phillips. Adam Phillips. You're familiar with his work no, a little bit. Not really. Yeah. You told yeah. me about him, and that's when I looked him up. Well, Adam is incredible. I, I highly recommend him, if nothing else, for his great titles. One of the, his books is called On Kissing, Tickling, and Being Bored. I highly recommend it. He also wrote a book called On Monogamy. I'm not going to tell you if he's for it or against it, but you should definitely read it. And Adam and I have been speaking for about 15 years. And we did the Paris Review interview finally that sort of brought a lot of it together. But it was like a little analysis itself. It was kind of a doubling of, of an analytical process, speaking to each other over such a long period of time. And it is interesting to go back to people mm. again and again and again, partly because maybe this time I will be successful. Maybe in. this time I will find an, a, a road in. Or maybe this time you will know what it is you, do you know what it is you want before you go into that conversation? You know, your, 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 your question is so interesting because it can be read in two ways with the, 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 the kind of semicolon or, or comma you put, do you mm. know what you want? And then do you know what you want when you go into a conversation? Two different questions. And I think I, I um, I would have to say in both cases, I don't. I don't know what I want quite clearly, and I don't know what I want quite clearly when I go into a conversation, but I know that I want. I want want. I, I want, I want. I'm, I'm a man of appetite. I just desire more. I always want more. I'm, I feel that with age, I'm becoming more and more insatiable. You know, I just, I just want to know more things. And, you know, here in, in Calcutta, I've had the occasion of traveling with someone uh, uh, around the city, and she knows so much about the city. And I think to myself, oh, my God, how ignorant can you be in not the twilight of your life, but when it's a little bit late to learn Indian history? How, how is it that I know so little? And so I'm... I can't make up for it, but I, I, I know that I'm going to read about it and try to educate myself. And the same happens in conversations. I, I, want to, I want to find out. I want to find out. I want to find out what you want to find out. I want to find out right now, if you had the occasion to say, interview the current president of the United States, what would you want to find out from him? Why he's not stepping down? Uh, no, sorry. Um, um, what would I want to find out? Well, I, I, I would be curious um, to know what the game plan is there. Well put. I, diplomatic. I, yeah, input. I would. Well, the first answer was not diplomatic. The second one, and diplo diplomacy should be important. We. We have the Consul General uh, of the United States, so I, I should probably be a little more neutral. But forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Well, don't forgive me. But anyway, um, no, I would want to find out why are you doing this? 
And how do you live a life? Um, how do you live a life where so much of what you say is, not, it isn't a question of it being controversial, but it being false. How do you, how do you, I'm, I'm, I'm always curious about it, but in a terribly naive way, how do you, how do you live with that? How do you manage? And I think one of the ways you manage is just by moving forward so quickly. I mean, that it doesn't it, matter. It doesn't matter. You know, I have, I have at home, my oldest son is a magician. And it's, it's fantastic to have an in-house magician because I'm realizing what it means, what sleight of hand means, and what sleight of hand means in political terms. How you can distract people. How you can confuse them. You know, how you can uh, be a con man. I'm, I would be interested in, I would ask him, does he sometimes think he's a con man? I mean, I'm sure I wouldn't get any answer to any of it. And anyway, with, with people who are in off, I mean, I've, I, I spoke with Clinton and I spoke with a number of other people, and usually what they want is they want to know what questions you will ask, and I've never invited anybody who made that re request. Because also you don't know what questions you're going to ask. No, you don't. Time. You don't. But I would, but you were asking me what would I want to know. I, 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 I guess I would want to know what the game plan is. You know, what, what, you know, does it have to do with anything else but yourself? I would want to know... What would you want to know, yes. I would actually want to figure out if the president has a sense of humor. Right. Because I remember... I a think quote, he thinks he does. Maybe, but because I remember a quote you had um, where you said fundamental... Uh, your quotomania might have affected me. I don't know if it's, this is your quote that I wrote it down, you quoting someone else. Well, it, but it, it, either way, I, it, either it, way it, it came from you. And in a way, it doesn't any more matter. I'm, I, I'm, 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 every, I'm every piece of, of, of food I've eaten is in part, exactly. part of... Yes. And you said, it said fundamentalism and literalism come from a deep-rooted sense of being limited or lacking in humor. And it, occurs, it occurred to me that Republican or Democrat aside, this is the first president that I remember who didn't, doesn't seem to have a sense of humor. All other US presidents have, to me, had a sense of humor because US presidency has been so much about being likable. You know, and they've all had, and this time it feels like that is missing. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if it's true, and I, I think that, um, our, our current president has made us view all the presidents who came before him. In a different way. In we a different way, way. As, if, as if they were um, good presidents. Um, and, um, no, and, and, and I think, you know, in a way, one of the things that, that Trump has been very successful at is, is making us look at that past as if it, you know, I've heard people sort of glorify presidents whose legacy is far from, you know, who, who I mean, anyway, uh, this is complicated, <laughs> but, I, but, I will, uh, but I will say, to come to the subject of humor, humor is a lubricant. Hmm. Um, we say we humor people. Um, we talk about a sense of humor. Um, if you if you don't share a sense of humor with someone, you really can't be with them. I mean, it's the one thing that really, if they don't get your, I mean, you can have the best sex in the world if you don't have humor to lubricate the sex. It just won't work. I mean, you, humor is what will, you know, in a mechanism, we talk about it having game um, and having, uh, uh, if it's too tightly woven, it breaks. So we need the humor in a sense for me is all, and I think that tyrants don't have humor. It's black and or white. I think humor actually uh, making fun of somebody in power who wants that kind of power is very dangerous. I mean, we can- As we, more, we, all over the world, people yeah. are realizing this. And I think they realize it probably in, in your country. They certainly realize it in the country where I reside. And by the way, I am an American citizen. I mentioned this, um, and I, I speak out of love for the country, but also out of sheer worry. I wanted to uh, have you guys ask questions, but before that, I, you know, we've been hearing 
Paul's interviews, audio clips, I thought maybe we could play a little clip on video of seeing Paul in action. And so this is uh, if you would, Paul talking to the filmmaker David Lynch. Idea comes, and you see it, and you hear it, and you know it. How does it come? It comes like on a TV in your mind. <laughs> you know, there's a, a, a line I've, I've always loved of, of Leonard Cohen. He said, if I knew where the good songs came from, I would go there more often. Absolutely. <laughs> People, we, want, I, we don't do anything without an idea. So they're beautiful gifts. And I always say, you desiring an idea is like a bait on a hook. Yeah. It can pull them in. And if you catch an idea that you love, that's a beautiful, beautiful day. And you write that idea down so you won't forget it. And that idea that you caught might just be a fragment of the whole, whatever it is you're working on. But now you have even more bait. Thinking about that small fragment, that little fish, will bring in more. And they'll come in and they'll hook on. And more and more come in, and pretty soon you might have a script, or a chair, or a painting, or an idea for a painting. But they come as in small... More often than not, small fragments. I like to think of it as in the other room, the puzzle is all together, but they keep flipping in just one piece at a time. In the other room? Over there. <laughs> <laughs> in, in a sense, David, there's always another room somewhere. Mm -hmm. That's Let's... a beautiful thing to think about. Let's think about it a bit. No, you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Can you have the lights back on, please? And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you guys um, in the other room <laughs> over there to questions for Paul. Um, there's a mic that's... Uh... Hi, thank you for a great conversation. Uh, you had mentioned that not all of your conversations have been successful. I was interested in hearing then about some of your unsuccessful ones and what one or two uh, come to mind uh, as your biggest regrets that left you most um, thinking, oh, if only I had asked that question or why didn't I think of a a asking this? And you know, in a way I can, I can answer that question by also talking about being loved. Um, when, when it isn't successful, you feel unloved and you feel that communication hasn't worked. And in one particular case, I'll, I'll mention him by name, he's become somewhat of a, uh, someone I very much like now. We've, we've gotten to be friendly with each other. Uh, but in the first conversation I had with him, and I promise you I'll disclose his name, um, this was a very, very famous artist. Every question I would ask him, he would say to me, yes. Yeah. Not, not really. Interesting. I mean, that, that was it. The whole time. And actually, people have watched the conversation and have found it, from their point of view, interesting. Even the resistance was interesting. My reaction to that failed attempt was to say to myself, I have to invite Matthew Barney back. I have to, you know, and I have to find a way of bringing... Uh, this very famed artist back because I, I have to, you know, I have to conquer him. I have to somehow find a way of making, of making it happen. Um, there, there have been a, a few, quite a few other examples where um, I've spoken to journalists, especially um, uh, newscasters, um, uh, some of them, you would, maybe, maybe they are leave, I'll leave the names unknown, still very famous people in the, in the world of television, where they have given an answer that is so canned mm -hmm. and so predictable 
and it nearly feels like, you know, instead of coming here for an interview, why don't you just stand here and read from your book? You're not going off, I mean, in a way, you're like a TED talk. You're not going off script, or if you seem to be improvising, you actually aren't really doing that. I don't know if that answered your question I, somewhat. And there, there are often people who just, you know, not that interested in being interviewed, and they, they've come because they have a book out. I've read that, um, for example, RuPaul initially was not that interested when well, you were. Well, do, do, does everybody know who RuPaul is? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So RuPaul was really not interested in coming, was very skeptical of my desire to interview him, her, however you wish to, to speak about RuPaul. And um, at first, the, the conversation was tremendously confrontational. I mean, he, he just wouldn't, and he didn't come dressed up as a drag queen at all. His, actually, his seven words were fantastic. I asked all my guests to give me a biography of themselves in seven words, and his seven words were, we're born naked and the rest is drag. Beautiful, perfect, and so when, when... Drag queens get an extra word. Oh, 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 oh we're born naked, yeah, yeah. and the rest is, is drag. drag. Yeah, I think he got it right, I, I hope so. Or I misquoted it if he didn't. Joan Didion had the best seven words I know of, where she said, seven words do not yet define me. It was wonderful, but at any rate, RuPaul... Well, well, before you go to RuPaul, yeah. you should say your seven words. Well, my seven words were not my seven words, which proves the point. My seven words were what my mother told me when I was 11 years old. My mother told me, and I, I'm not sure I can do it in seven words, but they were seven words when I, when I responded. My mother said to me when I was 11 years old, she said, you know, Paulie, we have two ears and one mouth. Probably because I wasn't listening. And I always say that that is kind of the origin story for me. Uh, I've constructed it, obviously, but I feel like those, those that, that way of thinking is what is fundamentally important when we speak to people, is that listening and silence is more important than actually talking. Actually, when you watched the David Lynch interview, there were bizarre moments. There are moments where there is a silence. I look at him. I look at him and I wait. And he feels slightly embarrassed. And then he goes on. I mean, you probably saw that. And he also speaking, it was a wonderful segue because he, spoke, he was so wonderful in terms of humor. But let's get back to, to RuPaul. RuPaul. RuPaul, after um, about five minutes of giving me a hard time, and basically making me feel that every question I asked was idiotic, and how dare I, stopped and said, you know, you are beautiful. He said to me, to which I had nothing to say, and then he said, you know, I'd like to kiss you. <laughs> and I, I mean, of course, and you know, and there was this incredible tension. I mean, you know, and, and I looked at him and nothing happened. And I said, I'm, I'm really so sorry that You're so shy. Act on it. And that, of course, made him, it, it re, he, he was a master. He, he controlled the situation. He made it happen. We had the same thing recently. And you danced. And we danced. And we danced on stage. I mean, when, when does that happen? Dancing with RuPaul maybe should be the title of the book I might write someday. In the part two. Yeah, of part the, two. Part two. I think there was, there was a question back there. Well, uh, you, uh, you are in uh, New York Public Library and uh, you also interviewed so many famous persons. Now my question is to you that can you ever read any a book of poet Rabindranath Tagore, who is a famous uh, Nobel Prize winner of India? Please tell it. Can we, can we read a... Uh, any book of poet Rabindranath Tagore? Have you read any read. Have, have, you, have you read? I, I, ha I have. Huh. Um, I, I, read, I read his poetry as I was growing up, and today I went to the, I went to the museum, uh, which was an extraordinary experience. And he was 
one of my father, I think it was the generation then with Romain Roland and Tagore and others. For my father, Tagore was incredibly important. And I think this morning when I, when I went off to the museum, I went in part to pay homage to, to the, that world of yesterday that inhabited them so much. But I, ha I have read some of his poetry. I can't quote any of it to you, but I, I know that after my visit today, I will go back. And one of the things that Sandeep and I spoke about briefly today is what, what struck me so amazingly strongly in the museum is just how much that man traveled, how much he went, he went to discover in days when it was much harder to travel. He went to China, he went to Japan, he spent, a, a, there's a whole room in, in uh, the museum devoted to his stay in Hungary. Um, just the, the sheer curiosity of going to discover other cultures and also, of course, going then to the United States. There's a whole room you know, to, devoted to China, to the, Japan, to the United States. All these various people who wanted to uh, meet him and who he wanted to meet as well. Okay, other questions? And I, would love, question? and I would love to, I would have Do loved, have to, I would have loved to interview him. Or, there are all kinds of dead people I would have loved to interview. Malcolm. So I think it would be interesting for the audience as well as to you all, if you continue a little more on your conversation regarding the pres present president of the United States. Tell us something. It, was, it, was, it is good, nice that the topic was brought in because he's really so controversial and topical and so different from everyone else. And how he's able to just change the course of history single-handedly. Well, you talked a bit about that. Yeah, we that talked also. a little bit about it. For example, it. And I, I, no, the entire I, globalization yeah. policy is exactly reversed it. He's made America totally isolationist today. So little more the uh, audience would be interested and everyone else would like to know if the two of you all engage a little more. Um, I, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I want to turn back the question in, in some way to you wondering whether he's, he's going to change the, the course of history. He certainly has changed the way we, um, we read and consume uh, news. I think one of the, the most um, worrisome parts for me of the current administration is the fact that um, so, there's so much falsity in, in what is said that there is, and there is such speed at which the falsity is said, you know, with, and fake news, I, I am saved by the screen. See, and, 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 that's called, uh, yeah. it's called, what is the yeah. hand of the, God? Yeah, yeah, the hand of God, the invisible <laughs> hand of God. Channeled through Queen so, Victoria herself. So I'm, 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 uh, I'm just, um, I'm, I'm worried by the fact that we, we're living in an age with uh, this kind of president who makes news happen really through Twitter. You know, I interviewed Jane Mayer once at the, at the library and I asked her about some event that was happening in those days. And she said, how should I know? I've been off Twitter for 10 minutes. I don't know what's <laughs> happened. I don't know. So that is very, and that is, that is very connected to go on, on, a, on, on a territory that is more, uh, how should I say, a little, a little closer to my, to my abilities, which is that um, we, 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 we just don't have the time anymore for considerate opinion, for sustained attention, so that you know, the, the president can issue um, orders by simply using 280 characters. I think there was a question back there. Yes, hi. Uh, two questions, actually, um, because one I just thought of. The first is that both our countries are uh, trying to deal with the kind of fascism which is growing, if not in government, at least in a changing mindset. And why is it, do you think, that the two, great, two democracies, which have been celebrated all over the world as the largest and the oldest or the biggest, uh, are going through this? Why are we vulnerable to this right now? And the other question is that, what is the question you would like to ask Sandeep which you haven't done so far. <laughs> I'm not being asked questions. You take the first question. Um, 
I don't know. I mean, I really, I, d I don't know what has brought us into this stinking mess. Um, I, I, I don't feel, I, I have to be honest here, I don't feel qualified to give a, a good answer. I can tell you that uh, the, the previous guest you had here, somebody of, of much greater stature, and you know, possibly one of the 10 greatest living historians in the world today, Carlo Ginzburg, said to me recently that in his entire 60-year career of being a professional historian, as it were, 55 years, he has never in his lifetime, until last year, permitted himself to use the word fascism to describe uh, the, the United States today, or leaning towards, towards that. And um, I've asked him to, to unpack that notion. Um, and hopefully when he does, I'll have a better answer. I don't know well enough. I don't feel qualified to, 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 um, to, an to answer that question. I, w I would say to your second no, question. No, no, I was hoping you'd to, forgotten that to, part. No, 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 to your second question, uh, what question, Sandeep, would you, would you hope that I would ask you? Oh, that's like... Who is this? Like a volley, you just yeah. volley. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, 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 I love, I love ping pong, uh, uh, as I said. So it's, it's a way of. I, all right. Yeah. The question I hope you would ask me is, Sandeep, what would your seven-word biography be? What would your seven-word biography be? <laughs> That's too be? easy. I'll answer that after we take the okay. question from here. Yeah. I'll think about yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> you see one. Uh, one is a little comment about Herzog that you made, uh, because I am an admirer of Herzog and his films, and I've got the occasion to uh, get to know him personally also. Uh, he, you talked about that plane episode, right? That is it's his an, attitude. An, an of, anecdote. Yeah, yeah, it's an anecdote, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, that's the kind of attitude that this man has, and that reminds me of this other documentary film he made called La Souffriere, where a volcano was supposed to erupt in uh, the island of Guadeloupe, and he just went with his cameraman, and the volcano did not erupt. But if it had erupted, he may have been erased also, but he still went and made the film. It's a half an hour film. And he has also made films on kind of other kinds of minorities, like, you know, in the land of silence and darkness, and even dwarfs started small and so on, wonderful things. Yeah. But the other question I have for you is, is a takeoff from what Madam Consul General had asked you and your response to it. Because you had said that you, I would love to call that man back and conquer him, yeah? Every kind of interview that you do, do you take it like a battle that has to be won? Is there a streak of agire within you? A, 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 a streak of? Agire. agire. Well, first of all, to, to your comment about uh, Werner Herzog and putting himself in, the, in, in danger, as it were. I think, um, he, you know, in, in the passage you heard from the interview at, the, at, at BAM, um, he makes up this quotation of Pascal. So you could, you could begin thinking that this man makes no difference between fact and, and fiction. Au contraire, he actually thinks that in order to, to make uh, 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 Aguirre, you, you absolutely have to carry the boat over the mountain. You ha there, there has to be a physical relationship which has to be truthful. If not, it's some kind of a, a cheap Hollywood uh, film which, which, for which Werner Herzog has very little patience. So that's one part. The other part is no. I, I don't think, um, I, I, want, I, I want to be loved, but I don't want to conquer. I don't think there's a Casanova in me in that way. I don't want to conquer the heart of, but I want to create a, a, a relationship of, um, of intimacy, of some kind of an exchange. Um, I want to be sure that a lot of things remain unsaid. I don't want to... I don't want to possess the other. I don't want to frame them. Um, you know, there's a wonderful line of Lawrence Stern where he says, to define is to distrust. So I, I want to leave a lot of room. I don't want the person to become kind of this um, icon 
that I can put on my mantelpiece and say, I conquered you. Scout. Look, look, at, my, look, look at my medal. Look, I have it here. You're mine now. No, you're always elsewhere. But the, the, the events that really haven't word, worked is when, you know, as you say in French, le courant ne passe pas, the, the current didn't go through. Something didn't happen. I thought of my seven word biography. Yeah, what was, was yeah. All right, I have to count it. Wait, will, will Paul Holden Gerber interview me one day? Yes. <laughs> I, so I guess, yes, yes. And why would you like that? I don't know, that was just the seven word bio. <laughs> you can't ask but, for but, but would you like that? Of course. You know, it's interesting because so, so what's happened to me, and we'll get to your question in a moment, I promise you. What's happened to me over, over the years is that people have requested that I interview them. And there have been times when I just, I, 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 I just had done five in, in two weeks and I just couldn't. Or, you know, a friend of mine actually, uh, Rebecca Mead, who writes for The New Yorker, wrote this incredible book about George Eliot and Middlemarch. And w was I going to reread Middlemarch? I have one life. And, you know, Middlemarch is a long, long book, and I did read it. It also reminds me always, you know, uh, about reading and not reading books. I had a, a, a professor of mine who once was asked if he had read a book, and he said, read it, I haven't even taught it. So, you know, there are ways in which, of course, one can get away with not reading it. But I said to Rebecca, I, you know, there's so many wonderful specialists of George Eliot. Just, you know, go and find one. I said it much nicer. And she said, no, I want the Holden Graeber treatment. And I thought that's really interesting, because it's like nearly being on a shrink's couch. Uh, you know, the treatment. And so I'm wondering, is that what you want? Uh, possibly. <laughs> okay. Possibly. Hi. I really loved your interview today. And you. uh, my question is, uh, you do have your own values and your own set of ideas on how things should be. So do you find them coming in the way of your interviewing a person? How often does that happen? And uh, do you worry about it? And uh, how has it affected some of your interviews and the outcomes in terms of success and failure? That would be interesting it's to know. Interesting Thank you. Question. Uh, how do you understand that question? It's basically, can you, when you, you have to keep your, obviously, you have to an open mind, you, you're yeah. trying to talk to the person, but your values might be in conflict with what that person is saying. Yeah. and, and uh, Go ahead. And, and I don't hate Trump so much. Right. But yeah, and so that's why this question came up. You have such strong opinions about him. Yeah. Yes, but, but, but not, not, sufficiently, not sufficiently informed, um, which I'll be the, the first to recognize, not sufficiently re informed in the sense of being able to, dis to, to contribute a, a, you know, a, 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 um, an informed co conversation about this. I, I think that... Um, there have been many occasions when I've been in conversation with people who, whose uh, world view did not at all work with mine. Um, the point there, first of all, I don't believe in, in, in a conversation being well-rounded. Uh, I don't actually even believe in well-rounded people. I think they should have edges. They should have, you know, points which of, Rub disagree, of rubbing. Um, I think What's an interview without yeah, a bloody knuckle a little or a bit, scrape on a the elbow? A little bit. They should, some of it should function as an eczema. There should be a little bit of irritation. We should need some cream to, to cool us off or something. So um, what, what needs to happen there is I think that there have been plenty of moments, I can't recall all of them now, there have been plenty of moments where the audience has perceived very clearly a difference of point of view. And what you need to do in those moments when you're on stage is just leave it. Leave it, be quiet, and let people make up their own mind. And let the differences stay there. And yes, of course, I think every single conversation I've had, to some extent, 
changes things slightly um, and changes you. The people you encounter, it isn't only on a stage. The stage has a diff different effect. The stage heightens things. Um, you remember what happens on stage perhaps more than in many other places. Other questions? Yeah, if there's one question, otherwise we are going to, yeah. Hi, Thank, thanks so much, Paul, for this fascinating talk. Um, I just, I was curious about who would be the five dead people you would have liked to interview most of all. And that, that's one. The other is, like Mike Tyson, uh, who surprised you. Uh, you know, he quotes from Cicero. He, he knows the right uh, oldest edition of Machiavelli is the Prince. Who would be maybe five people who uh, went against the grain, who surprised you most of all by going beyond or against your expectations? Well, one of the people I mentioned to the students yesterday who I would have loved to interview came very, very close to interviewing was Leonard Cohen. Um, and I would have loved to talk to him. And sadly, I couldn't. There have been a couple of people I've had on my, on my phone call from Paul, which you heard at the very beginning, I simply pick up the phone and call people I admire. They do know that I will call them. So we make a, a phone date, as it were, and then speak on the phone with Sula Le Guin and John Berger. But those are two people who died now, who I would have loved to have longer and more sustained and in-person conversations. I would have, I mean, I have heroes that have been incredibly important to me, people who have been part of my sentimental education. Um, I, I don't know, mentioning sentimental education, I don't know that Flaubert would have been a great subject for, for an interview, but I would have loved to talk to Proust. I would have loved to talk to Rainer Maria Rilke. I would have loved to talk to Tagore and Zweig. I would have loved to talk to Montaigne. Um, I would have loved to talk to Virginia Woolf. Um, there are all kinds of people. I would have loved to talk to Gandhi. I would have loved to talk to some of the great politicians of the past. I think there, I would have loved to talk to Rachmaninoff. I would have loved to talk to Mozart. I would have loved to talk to Ben Webster. I would have loved to talk to Ben Webster about one album he did, which is probably the greatest jazz album ever, which is called Atmosphere for Lovers and Thieves. And I would have loved to talk to him about why he had to escape America in the 1960s because he felt that there was so much racism that only Denmark could welcome him, and that's why so many musicians left the States in those years. I would have loved to find out more about that. Um, the people I've loved speaking with more, most, like Mike Tyson, are people with whom I have nearly nothing in common. Um, actually, the most extraneous people, speaking with Shaquille O'Neal, I mean, what? I mean, I barely know what sport he plays. I don't understand all of it, any of it. He lives at a completely different temperature. He, when he arrived, he has a size 28 in feet. He's seven foot six. Um, uh, you know, somebody wanted a photograph with him, and he said, I'll do it as long as I can first levitate you. So he, you know, and I, there I was speaking to Shaquille O'Neal, and it was absolutely fantastic. It was because, again, it was like the question you had. It was two worlds that seemed so far apart, and we fought, found common ground. Same thing happened. I was telling the students this, uh, speaking with Jay-Z. Uh, there are reasons why I invite people like Jay-Z. At that point, I had a son who was eight years old and a son who was five years old, and I wanted to be cool. Impress them. I wanted to be cool for four days. I mean, so I got to invite Jay-Z. That was fantastic. And I, what do I know about hip-hop? Nothing. But that is interesting to me. The less I know sometimes, of course, the research is done. And it's done extensively. And I live in their music. I listen to everything Jay-Z did. I listen to every record that Pete Townsend ever put out. I listen to every record that Elvis Costello did, or Van Cliburn, the great, the great pianist. I listen to everything. But I don't know that culture. I didn't grow up with it. I grew up with you know, the magic flute. I grew up with a very different set of ideals and ideas and tastes. But how interesting it is to talk to someone like Jay-Z and find out that your life has been utterly different. Um, and I, I so much loved 
I love speaking with him. But is, the, is this not knowing when you see you yeah, do all the research? Yeah. But is, is this what Carlo Ginsberg was talking about when he says the euphoria of ignorance? You take the words out of my mind. I was just about to say something of that nature. Carlo Ginsberg, who, as I said, is to my mind one of the really greatest living historians, I have the good, great fortune of being, um, of being quite close to him. And so I, I've spent a little bit of time with him in his home in Bologna, actually, recently, between the jobs I've, I had at the library in uh, Los Angeles. And when you arrive in Carlo Ginsburg's home, you see tables with books and papers, hundreds of books, hundreds of papers. And I said to Carlo, what is this? And he said, well, in fact, I'm preparing a paper and I need to look up a reference. And he approaches his subjects, as he says, with a euphoria of ignorance, meaning he knows very little, but he's utterly passionate about what he's searching for. And he doesn't quite know what it is. And he thinks that somehow the clues will be found in these thousands of books. He has tens of thousands of books. And I said, you know, I didn't ask him the question that everybody asks anybody who has more than 200 books, which is, have you read them all? I, people ask me this all the time, and I have a canned response to this. I tell people when they ask me, have you read all these books? I said, twice. <laughs> it usually works as a, as, as a response very quickly. But Carlos says there is no such thing as a useless book. You will always find something, something. And the euphoria of ignorance is, in a way, I, I think it might be close to some Eastern ways of thinking. You, appro you approach it in, a no, in an unknowing, it was in the cloud of unknowing. You approach it not knowing. And maybe by being porous, you will also be able to, to, to embrace and to understand and to think um, about your subject deeper. We're going to have to end this, but I will beg your indulgence and play one last clip to leave you with and have your closing. And, yes. And may I say one thing before you do? Yes. I just want to say that I, I, I really would like to thank all of you for coming. I really would like to thank you for taking a perfectly lovely Friday afternoon and evening to come to, to this evening. Um, I'm really very grateful. I'm grateful to the, to the city of Calcutta, and I'm particularly grateful to all the wonderful people at Siegel, and most particularly grateful to, to Naveen Kishore. I wanted to, to thank you for this invitation. One day, out of the blue, blue is a color I like, out of the blue, I got a, a, a message from Naveen saying, you know, I followed your work. Um, uh, I'm, I'm interested with what you do. It was a very emphatically warm message. And he said, you know, you don't know me, perhaps, but I'm the publisher of Siegel Press, and I think you, you should come to, to India. Um, some gifts are just given to you for no other reason than the desire to do something, which was extraordinary to read. And then he ended his message by saying, I think you, you need India. So um, I think I do, and uh, I want to thank you for, for, for being here. But that's so wonderful, because you, once you wrote a letter like that to Patti Smith. I did. I wrote and that. now the, karma, the wheel of karma yeah, turns, and, and I, you get and, that and letter. And I, I wrote a letter like that to Atul. I yeah. wrote a letter like that to Atul Gawande, yeah, the great, great uh, doctor in, 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 in New York, uh, in the United States, just saying, I, I I want to speak to you. Yes, I, I'm, I'm yeah, a culprit of that. I have a small that. question. Yeah. Uh, have you ever interviewed President Obama or Michelle Obama? Or if not, do you intend to? Um, I have never. I, I, I think the moment um, for Michelle Obama probably would be now because she has a book uh, to, to further. Uh, but I think um, I. I I would have liked to, but I don't think I will, unfortunately. Well, here's, I w there's no need to guess here. This is the literary critic. What do you mean Harold when you say Smith. immortal wound? Well, if a poem pierces you enough in heart and in intellect so that you never really get over it, it's, 
It qualifies as an immortal wound. Shakespeare, or rather his Hamlet, speaks of wonder wounded hearers, H-E-A-R-E-R-S. Any poet, we don't ask that they all be Shakespeare, that they all be Hamlet, but any poet who wounds you by wonder has given you probably an immortal wound, provided there's not something wrong with you, of course. Perhaps in some sense, without knowing it, at least too explicitly, you keep falling in love, whether with books or people, because you fear that the deep human energy in you is beginning to ebb. Perhaps that's why I go on teaching, I'm not altogether sure. Would you, would you agree with Cicero that to philosophize is to learn how to die? In some way we, we, we read in order to prepare ourselves. The great I don't books. like that, no. My, my, my heart is not with Cicero, it's with Sir John Falstaff. Give me life. The meaning of the broker. Give me life. Give me I life. thought we should end on that. I think it's wonderful. And Sandeep, thank you so much. I hope to interview you soon. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much, Sandeep. Thank you for a fantastic evening. And at the end of this evening, I, for one, and I'm sure all the others feel so too, uh, are convinced that our great expectations for this evening were not unfounded at all. So thank you for this wonderful, wonderful evening and for convincing us also that you are very much down to earth and not a Luftmensch by any means at all and what I loved particularly which was fascinating what the seamless role reversals that you both of you did that you starting to ask him questions and he starting to ask him that worked wonderfully and to end this evening I would also indulge in some kotomania uh, where I would end with Naveen's line and say you need India so come back please thank you very much thank you and thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. That's all for tonight. Our next event is on Tuesday here at 6 o'clock in the same venue. Uh, it promises to be another interesting evening. So if you have the time and the inclination, do come back.